good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the Bonavere Institute of Human Rights. We don't that often have a South African occasion, but it is fantastic to see so many South Africans here. And it's a particular honor and pleasure for me to welcome firstly Dr. Stephen Redit, who you all know as a distinguished member of the Constitutional Court and the group with some very important judgments, including some important dissents. Always a good thing to do, I think, and particularly in the case of the Kylo, which I'm sure may uh, come up in some further uh, discussion this evening. Um, and then, uh, in addition, we have an about to be acting judge of the Constitutional Court. We didn't know we were going to get it almost a full of the day. Um, uh, Professor David Bilchitz, who again probably doesn't need much introduction to you. Uh, David is a distinguished scholar, particularly in the field of economic and social rights. He's a professor at the University of Johannesburg and the director of the South African Institute for Advanced Constitutional Studies there, and also jointly a professor at the University of Reading. So, very warm welcome to you as well, um, David. And then finally, of course, my, my colleague, um, uh, Sandra Friedman, uh, another very distinguished scholar in this field, um, and we are very pleased to welcome her. And then online, and I don't think we can see you, Taryn, but can you hear us, Taryn? Yes, I can, Kate. Oh, that's great. Excellent. That is uh, Professor Taryn Caton, uh, now the Chair of Public Law at the London School, School of Economics and Political Science, and formerly the Head of Research here at the Bonavera Institute, and himself a very distinguished scholar in the field of um, equality and comparative constitutional law. So I think we're really in for a, an a interesting and important discussion around the adjudication of economic and social rights uh, under the South African Democratic Constitution. So looking around the audience, I'm not sure how much introduction this topic requires, but we thought we might start, uh, I would start just by saying a few introductory words. Um, you will all know, of course, that the South African Constitution, the current South African Constitution of 1996 came into force on the 4th of February, uh, 1997. It contained within it a very generous collection of rights, including civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights. And the formulation of economic and social and cultural rights uh, draws very heavily on the international covenant, the economic, social, and cultural rights. And it has been one of the areas of jurisprudence developed by the court, which has attracted a lot of attention and also a lot of contestation. One cannot really understand the South African uh, adjudication of economic and social rights without having some picture in your mind of the demographic inequality that remains deeply embedded in South African society as a result of centuries of colonial dispossession and then apartheid uh, um, uh, racial discrimination. And, and 30 years after our new constitutional order began, those patterns, if anything, have intensified. So probably the saddest part of the South African story is just how little um, patterns of racial um, inequality um, have been undone in 30 years of democratic government. In addition, however, and I think why this is such a, uh, a complex and difficult question, is that in that same 30 years, what we have seen again and again and I'm sure that um, Justice Majid is going to talk about this, is cases being brought before the court. South Africa has a very vibrant uh, public interest law sector. Cases being brought before the court um, um, on the basis of economic and social rights, generally by people who are living in terribly deprived circumstances, not only in our cities, but in rural areas as well. Access to housing, access to land, access to education, access welfare benefits, access to water, access uh, to the basic necessities of the life, or life, all of which are protected by economic and social rights, are the cases that people bring. And orders are issued by the court, and those orders are not always implemented. And we see that again, and I'm, I'm sure that Justice Majid will talk a little bit about um, to our kind of And I think one of the things to realize about that is that it's, it's enormously frustrating and saddening but it also becomes a strategic question in thinking about, well, how does one deal with this jurisprudence, um, both for lawyers, for practicing lawyers, and I think for, for courts, in trying to ensure that um, communities who legitimately are entitled to rely on their rights to bring them to the court 
are entitled to the remedies that the Constitution promises. And I think this is a legally difficult question, it's a morally difficult question, and it's enormously emotional question as well. It's very hard not to respond to these questions that they arise in emotional ways. So that's my introduction this evening. I think it's going to be an interesting conversation. Each of our panelists are going to speak for about 10 minutes. We're then going to turn to Q&A. We will not be filming the Q&A, um, but we will um, film at least some of the, um, of the presentations. There'll be a final question online or not, but it is currently online and there are people who registered online. Uh, that this is, um, if it is presently being broadcast and may well be uh, put online afterwards. So that's the format. They will then turn to you for questions and answers and I'm sure <laughs> That's going to be a very engaging session. We'll be followed by a reception outside of the prayer. So, welcome, Stephen. We're looking forward very much to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much, Faith. And uh, it's an absolute delight to be here. And uh, of course, all of you know that Justice O'Regan is one of the first justices of a very formidable court established by a much admired institution. And uh, my Colleagues here are not only my colleagues, but my friends. They become good friends. David Birchett, Sandy Friedman, experts in this field. And uh, it, it's just wonderful to be able to share ideas. And you'll hear us differ sharply. I know that my, my colleague David Birchett and I, who's going to become an acting justice, differ sharply on what I'm going to talk But let me start and let us give it an overview. It's important to just give a historical overview of how we got the socioeconomic rights. In, there were intense negotiations leading up to our interim constitution and the final constitution. And during those constitutional negotiations, one of the discussion items was whether we should have a bill of rights containing social economic rights, second generation. I don't think people like that in the most foremost right. But uh, there was vigorous discussion on that. And the liberation movements the, the, led by the African National Congress were very keen to have them in the Constitution because of the history of the country. They thought that civil and political rights per se would not be adequate, and they insisted that the clauses in the Freedom Charter that they and which would find resonance in the Constitution in the Bill of And so there were three possible, possible models. First, have no inclusion at all of uh, socioeconomic rights. Second, and the other extreme was to have a full panoply of justifiable socioeconomic rights uh, with no limitation at all on its enforcement. And then the third one, the via media, was to have limited justiciability clause. Socioeconomic rights, uh, which would be enforceable only with regard to reasonable availability of resources and their progressive realization of this. As we know, the negotiators and also like the parliament settled for the via media. So then the constitution went to the constitutional court for certification and the court certified ultimately based on the four constitutional principles, the constitution and it dismissed objections to the inclusion of social economic rights. There were three major objections uh, to the inclusion. The first was that the objector said uh, before the court that these rights are not universally accepted, fundamental rights. The court held that that objection is unsustainable because the constitutional principle, principles in particular, number two, permit the constitutional assembly to supplement the universally accepted fundamental rights with other rights not universally accepted. The second objection was that the inclusion of the rights was inconsistent with the separation of powers doctrine. Because the judiciary would would have to encroach on the terrain of the legislature. That was also given short shrift at the court held that while is while that the inclusion of these rights may result in courts taking orders which have direct implications for the budget, uh, that would be true also when a court enforces civil and political rights such as equality, freedom of speech, and the like. And so the court will often have to make uh, such orders even in those in that sphere. The last objection was that this was uh, an automatic bar to the justiciability of these rights. Of course, they have much to say. Very minimum socioeconomic rights can be negative. 
Now I'm going to turn to some decisions of the early court. Now we're all familiar with the doctrine of precedent in our law, star edifices. It's a very important principle because it uh, grants certainty to lawyers and to judges alike as, and to all the lay people as to what the law is. And I would submit that it is even more important in a constitutional setting in an apex court. And so precedent was established by the early court which held that there would be no minimum core obligation. And this is where my colleague, uh, Professor Burgess and I, that's almost sharp, sharp. The, con the court held that uh, there can be no suggestion of a minimum core based on the wording <coughs> of the uh, of the clauses in <coughs> those that hold that the state must, and I quote, take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of the state. Now, minimum core uh, is premised on the notion that a basic minimum level of subsistence is required for the enjoyment of a dignified human existence. That, in broad terms, is what it is. The Constitutional Court rejected uh, this proposition and it's met with dissatisfaction in a number of quarters, especially among academics. And it is so in Hrubur, the housing case, the Human Action Campaign 2, which is the, the European case, and Masibuko, which is the other. Mazibuko was looking for a unanimous court on the college. In that judgment, Justice O'Regan wrote with reference to Fruitboom and to treatment action campaign that the same arguments that were presented in Mazibuko, which concerned whether there should be a minimum core, a minimum amount of water allocated to the applicants. She pointed out that based on the same arguments presented in Mazibuko, those were rejected in the first two cases that I mentioned. When you read Mazegoku, uh, in summary, also but simplified, but in summary, the rejection and the reasoning for this conclusion of the unanimous court based on two principles. First, that it flows from the very text of the constitution. Secondly, from a proper understanding of what the full role of courts are in a democracy, the constitution, democracy, the separation of powers principle. Now, in particular, the separation of powers principle is coming for fierce criticism from, from some academics um, a, as a sense of judicial timidity when more action is required. What the constitutional court has done in all of these cases, but particularly in Malibuko, the court has said that Instead of imposing a minimum core obligation, it would rather lay emphasis on the reasonableness of the measures taken by the state and to inquire whether there has been progressive realization of a particular social economic. So if we take fluid boom, what happened in fluid boom was that the court said to the Western Cape uh, a a a provincial government that the housing plan for emergency housing was inadequate. But it didn't rewrite the plan. Nor did it order the Western Cape government as to how the plan should be. It sent it back to the Western Cape government and said it grew on the plan. And eventually, they said the plan was adequate for after it being reformed. And of course, many uh, many critics point to the fact that this is Irene Fruitboom, which is a community that uh, my wife and I know very well because when I was a lawyer in Cape Town, we were quite active in that community when Mrs. Fruitboom lived in Monastery. Informal settlement. And it's really sad that Mrs. Frogum died without ever getting a house. But the point that I want to make uh, in discussing these cases is that A, it set precedent for, for those of us who followed uh, in that court later. And secondly, the reasoning, in my view, is sound based on the text of the Constitution. When a court considers whether there has been progressive realization, one must turn back the clock to around 1995, 2000, 2001, when these cases were heard. And remember that the court were in its infancy, the democracy was in its infancy, and there were huge obstacles to overcome. I mean, apartheid was pernicious. Apartheid was calculated to keep people not only separate, but to subjugate them. And it did so with careful policies 
And you couldn't just wave a wand to call the constitution and these would be settled would be would be settled and uh, and would disappear overnight. And most importantly, as far as my view is concerned, the court owed fidelity to the constitution, to its wording and its context, and to the principle of legality that it would, it would exercise only those powers that the law in particular the constitution allocated to it, and the principle of separation of powers. Now, separation of powers means judicial deference. It means that you must understand that your powers are to be adjudicated to a judge or to legislate and to execute policy, to make it to execute policy. That doesn't imply judicial timidity, in my view. And I can deal with these cases later when uh, it need be if we, if we discuss the principles that we're not here today. Suffice to say at this point is that a basis was established for courts after that, including the Apex Court, follow that. As I read the Constitution and as that court read the Constitution, it tells me that when the legislature drafted the Constitution, after all these negotiations and after the certification judgment, it was mindful of the massive scale of inequality that uh, had been brought about by apartheid. And it also secondly realized the limited financial means to achieve uh, overcoming it. So the justiciability of socioeconomic rights is not unbounded. They are bounded by the very words of the Constitution and by the principle of social powers. I'm going to, because time is limited, go uh, straight on to Tubakali. I've just laid a, a given you a broad overview of the court's earlier jurisprudence with reference to those three cases. And again, we can go into detail if you, uh, if, if, if you, you would like us to do further. I must dwell with Tubakali because uh, a little with Tubakali because it takes very close to my heart. It's a case which came to us from the High Court via the Supreme Court of Appeal, now the Muslim the court, the Supreme Court of Appeal is not Supreme, it's an appeal court. And the Constitutional Court is no longer just the Constitutional Court. It's now court of the But in Tubakali, uh, I wrote the main judgment, but I turned out to be the minority, which is uh, to me a, a very sad situation. The state, as in Khrushchev, failed to provide housing. But it was an emergency housing. These people had been granted what we call in South Africa housing subsidies. Those were grants given by the state to people who qualify for them so that the state could build houses for them. Long ago, in 1995. After many, many years, decades went past, and these people were still living in abject poverty. They were the poorest of the poor, living under terrible conditions, no access to water, sanitation, electricity. And they went to court and they sought an order that they be granted housing and they did get an order to that effect. The state failed to comply, or comply with that order and uh, the applicants then applied, uh, the applicants uh, within, uh, sorry, the respondents in the municipality then went to the appeal court to appeal the order of the high court. But they threw in the towel at the appeal court. All they asked for was an extension and uh, the court granted them an extension for a year and when the extension was bound to expire 48 hours before then, they approached the High Court again on an urgent basis seeking a further extension. The applicants were then really at uh, the end of their tether and they asked for constitutional damages. High Court refused uh, uh, constitutional damages and they came directly to our court. I held in favor of them with constitutional damages. I examined the history of the matter and I, in my judgment, uh, said that. This case has moved beyond Kuru. We were 20 odd years down the line. The housing policies were in place. There was a housing act, there was a housing code, and a subsidy scheme. All of this was in place. And I examined, examined the alternatives. I examined whether they could ask for contempt of court was for, uh, for damages under the civil law uh, and so forth. And I examined all of them and I came to the conclusion that this was a case where constitutional damage was the only effective remedy in section 38. Regrettably, I was in the minority, I was outvoted. Uh, one of the. I oh, just. Yeah, I was a no shame. There's actually a story behind the story, but something else I can't remember. <laughs> I'll share it with David when he comes to me. <laughs> Justice Jafka held that you could never grant constitutional damages where there's been a breach of social economic rights. A third judgment which concurred. To a limited extent with that judgment by Matlanga J, didn't go as far but how that constitutional damages were improved in the case. And so I was outvoted as uh, Justice Lee. 
I want to suggest that Tupakale represents a step forward. Also, if you read the minority judgment in Gladla, written by my colleague and good friend Edward Cameron, also a step forward in the sense that we said in that in those cases, both those cases, that one must move beyond and consider aspects like I didn't in Tupakale, spatial injustice, apartheid, deliberately correct, uh, created spatial uh, zones for, for race groups. And I said that we must move beyond fluid movement and see whether the state is progressively realized. To conclude, and uh, the time is limited, I have much more to say about this, but I'd better uh, hold my, my fire for now. I want to say that I think the way our jurisprudence will be developing, because remember, so actually the is in a regrettable state at the moment. The rich promise of the constitution and of liberation and of freedom is not materialized. Because of a number of factors, primarily the fact that those who are who have been elected to govern us have visibly failed in the constitution. And so a lot of pressure is placed on the courts to deliver in the sense that the courts are increasingly being asked, especially our court, even on a direct access basis, to, to tread where it shouldn't tread, where the legislature and the executive should. But I see it developing in the socioeconomic rights jurisprudence in our country as more and more people come and clamor to, to the court to have these rights realized. Otherwise, it's uh, just empty promise. It's to see whether the, the measures are reasonable. If the, if the government comes, if a department comes to the court and say, well, we don't have the budget, I think we're going to reach the point where we interrogate, well, show us what you've done with the budget. And we'll probably see gross maladministration, and we'll for sure see corruption on a grand scale, and we'll see the naked theft uh, of, of funds. And then the court will be able to interrogate, well, is it reasonable to say that the budget is there? I think we're going to ask the hard question is to say, show us over the last 30 years how you have progressively realized this right. It's no longer good enough to say, well, we are unable to realize the right because of lack of funds, or because of lack of our capacity, or because of apartheid. And so that is the way I see us developing those uh, jurisprudence. But for now, the court has said minimum core is not the answer. We may well, well revisit that because nothing is cut. Thank you for that. I suspect I've exceeded my time. Thank you very much, Justice. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present in this exciting seminar. It's Riga, and that's Fisa, Georgia, who I've been in touch with, involved in this, and it's wonderful to be on the panel with uh, uh, Justice Majit and Professor Fredman and Professor Kate Tan. Um, I'm also grateful to Professor uh, Judge Majit for reigniting the discussion on constitutional court's approach to socioeconomic rights. Um, and he's actually been very open to engaging with people who've been critical of the court's jurisprudence. And we had earlier in the year a discussion at the University of the Western Cape between myself and Professor Sandy Liebenberg and, and Justice Majit, and that series has continued. As many of you will know, part of my academic work has grappled with and presented constructive criticism of the approach of the Constitutional Court and sought to suggest directions in which it can be improved, only a small part of which I can present tonight. As you heard, I was recently appointed an acting justice of the Constitutional Court in the first part of next year. And as such, nothing I say tonight should be interpreted as any indication of how I would decide any particular case. And I remain open to be persuaded by litigants and my judicial colleagues on the applicable legal principles and application. Obviously, as a judge, precedent will play a much stronger role than one that necessarily gives it in academia. What I hope to accomplish in the short presentation is the following. I will utilize the Tupacali case that you heard um, to interrogate the reasonableness approach and try and show that it failed adequately to address the nature of socioeconomic rights as fundamental rights. I also hope to suggest some of the components of what a better approach would look like. So as Judge Bajit outlined, the Constitutional Court was faced with a difficult task of giving effect to socioeconomic rights in the context of historical deprivation of these rights, whilst recognizing the limited resources that exist in South Africa. And so it's perhaps understandable that in the early days of the court, when I was in fact a law clerk there, I was a law clerk on the, on the court room judgment, that the court felt it needed to tread a little carefully in an area which was still developing and on which there was limited judicial development, in fact, globally at the time. The court's approach to dealing with the difficulties of this jurisprudence was outlined by Justice Majit 
um, and related had two really essential components that the government is under a duty to institute a program to address the interests protected by socioeconomic rights, and that the court itself will evaluate whether that program is reasonable or not. And in the Ruppum case, actually, it developed a few criteria of what was meant by reasonableness. Now, reasonableness is itself, as the court recognized, a notion which needs further filling out. And I have argued in past work, as have others, that it is not in itself coherent without a conception of the content of socioeconomic rights. The point I wish to focus on here tonight is that it is the duty of the constitutional court, and so it is not outside the realm of its powers within the separation of powers, to give effect to the fact that socioeconomic rights are fundamental rights. And my contention is that the approach thus far has failed to recognize them as really rights at all and has maintained their second class status. And to illustrate this, I want to go to the Tubakale case you've heard from Dr. Majid, how it dealt with a community of people. And this is happening across the board in South Africa. Many of us know people in this context who weren't on a list, were waiting for housing, were in fact promised housing, had rights vested in them. And then these very houses were given to other people, right? And the question that rose, what do we do in that circumstance? What can the court do in such circumstance? And how can it address this wrong to those people who were living really, even by the admission of the government, in lamentable circumstances? And so the minority judgment, which, which in a sense carried the majority, but it, it's a complex way in which the majority is laid out, but the JAP, the judgment, whose actual holdings are not necessarily the majority, I should say, which thankfully, in my view, uh, is that it, it's, it said the following. Socioeconomic rights do not give individuals an entitlement to anything specific in any specific period of time. If an individual is deprived of a housing or health care or food, there's no wrong, there's no injury that has been done to them as they were never entitled to anything specific. So no damage can therefore be done to any individual because of a failure to realize socioeconomic rights and therefore reach the conclusion that there were no constitutional damages available. So a few choice quotes. Section 26.2 of the Constitution does not even remotely oblige the state to provide individuals with houses within a reasonable time from the date on which they applied for a house. The objective of socioeconomic rights is not to give South Africans access to basic necessities of life within a fixed period of time, but it is to set goals to achieve this purpose over time. And so ultimately, Judge Jafta and the two other judges who agree with him focused on what, what was essentially a fundamental difference between socioeconomic rights and other rights. And here, in my view, they essentially reduced socioeconomic rights not to rights at all. Um, and it's not quite clear what they are, other than nice to have goals in the constitution and directive principles. And in my view, 26.2 and 27.2 of the constitution were never meant to make these purely directive principles. They are justiciable rights. There are just some qualifications in those rights, just like their qualifications on freedom of expression in 16.2 as well. So um, uh, in Tuba Khale, um, the Vajit's view was that socioeconomic rights also do not give one in, in, an entitlement to anything specific. They do give one an entitlement to have the government develop a reasonable program and implement that program in a reasonable manner. In particular, they must implement it without reasonable delay. Where the government fails to implement the program in a reasonable manner, they do wrong to individuals effectively by failing to exercise their governmental authority properly. And they failed in this case to deliver what the government had already obligated itself to do in terms of legislation and in terms of its own decisions. And so by promising people housing and failing to deliver it, the government failed to exercise its authority properly and therefore did a harm or injury to these people, which warrants compensation. And so therefore, Justice Majid reached the conclusion that they could have been granted con constitutional damages. Now, I'm going to park to some extent the issue of constitutional damages because it raises a range of other questions about which remedies were the right remedies in this kind of case, because I'm really interested in what is said about socioeconomic rights per se. And both judges, I think there's a structural similarity in the reasoning between them in that they both say that individuals have no claims on the government flowing from socioeconomic rights. 
For Jeff, there is no wrong done at all. For Justice Majid, there is a wrong done, but the wrong relates to the failure of governmental implementation of the obligations it has already undertaken itself and promised, rather than any failure to fulfill the constitutional claims of individuals. And it's important to note the manner in which this approach effectively negates the idea that socioeconomic rights are in fact entitlements and rights that individuals have by virtue of their worth or dignity. Instead, they simply can claim on the better view, which Justice Majid holds, that the government exercises its authority in a proper manner and realizes the promises it has or it already has made. And for me, it's not clear then why socioeconomic rights are in the constitution, because it seems to me the right to administrative action coupled with a robust legality test requiring that the rule of law be followed would achieve everything that Justice Majid wants those rights to achieve. Ultimately, the government gave the people some kind of legitimate expectation that they would have their right to housing and they failed to follow through on that legitimate expectation. Importantly, from a language point of view, the court also collapses the rights into its qualifier. So section 26.1 is collapsed into section 26.2. And for that reason, I would argue the textual uh, basis of the argument is mistaken as well because it doesn't give proper a proper linguistic reading of the constitutional um, text. Like civil and political rights, in terms of the alternative, in my view, socioeconomic rights grant entitlements that flow from the very dignity or worth of individuals. That dignity requires being provided with certain resources or enabled to achieve certain capabilities, in the words of Martha Nussbaum, necessary to live a decent life. There is, a, of course, a large amount of need and limited resources in South Africa. And so, therefore, the court, in giving effect to socioeconomic rights, needs to develop principles to prioritize those whose needs are most urgent, for instance, the starving and the homeless, and require the government to have programs to improve conditions over time for the individuals in South Africa. Now, a very strong reason to shift the constitutional court's approach is to re recognize the result that it is having on the jurisprudence surrounding these rights. There are still only a handful of cases in over 27 years of the constitutional existence dealing with the actual obligations of the government positively to assist in the realization of socioeconomic rights. And now this is in a country where there is grinding poverty People literally lack the basic need to, needs they need to live, and there is increasing incapacity within the government, right? And from my own experience of trying to bring a case with some NGOs for universal grant to provide individuals with the minimum means of living, the reasonableness approach has made it extremely difficult for NGOs and individuals to bring cases around socioeconomic rights. This is because of the difficulty of having the burden to prove that a program is in fact unreasonable, which is incredibly hard to show often uh, for uh, organizations and individuals with limited resources. Reasonableness also, in my view, doesn't give proper expression to the separation of powers principle because, it, because of its very vagueness, it stands in for whatever the court thinks and when they want to intervene. It provides no clear demarcation of legitimate cases of interference for judges and where the judges should or should not get involved. And it also does not help other branches of government to understand their own obligations. And so in terms of the way forward, we see an increasing need and greater government dysfunction, as well as scarcity due to corruption and the incapacity to deliver in South Africa. In this, con in this context, the Constitutional Court, in my view, needs to think about a shift in order to fulfill the role the constitution has placed upon it to defend socioeconomic rights as fundamental rights. The court, I recognize, may find it unpalatable to simply jettison the reasonableness approach that has developed. And as Dr. Bajit said, there are reasons of, uh, of precedent to, con to follow it. Yet it is quite possible to take on board some of the proposed alternatives that academics and others have suggested within the reasonableness view. In fact, even in Fruitboom, I don't believe there was a complete rejection, for instance, of the minimum core approach, but there was a statement that the minimum core may be relevant to a determination of reasonableness. The court needs to avoid recognizing what, uh, stop avoid recognizing, avoiding recognizing what the socioeconomic rights are for, namely to protect the most basic interests of individuals to certain resources. 
It should also be prepared to recognize that prioritization will be needed. And it should also try and start developing principles on the basis of what that prioritization can involve, such as what desperate need constituted in Ruhrpur. In doing so, it can draw on the learnings of other courts from around the world and academic authors of what the best principles are in this regard. A uh, last point that I wanted to make in conclusion is that the reality is South Africa and socioeconomic rights jurisprudence will not just be solved by doctrinal changes. There needs to be a better system for accessing justice for poor people in the context of socioeconomic rights. And we should grapple with how that can be done so that, like in Colombia, individuals can in fact challenge when their, their rights are without a proud of their rights. And whilst we won't have exactly the same institutional structures, such as those of you know about the Tutela action in Colombia, South Africa's got a range of institutions which can function better in this regard. The Public Protector, the South African Human Rights Commission, and in my view, there probably is a requirement of the expansion of the court system, potentially to include more judges, to be able to address more cases that come in relation to these rights. The constitution, in my view, included socioeconomic rights for a reason. It recognized that they were universal entitlements to live a decent life, and it also recognized that they were absolutely essential to correct for many of the injustices of the past in South Africa. That should create an imperative for the constitutional court seriously to consider a shift in its approach, and in doing so, I hope it will ensure that these rights are not merely paper promises, but actually demonstrate to those least well off that South African democracy and its political community will not accept the devastating existing situation where individuals can simply be left to die naked on the streets of hypothermia and to perish from starvation and thirst. Thanks, David, for a characteristically clear mm -hmm. argument. Thank you very much, uh, Sandy. Um, yes, thanks so much. And um, can I also reiterate how Glad I am to be here in the company of Justice Maji, David Bilchers, and congratulations on becoming an acting justice. And thanks very much to Kate as well. You know, and of course, Kate has had an enormous contribution to this field in the early years of the court. And good to be here also with Taryn. So um, I want to come at this issue from a slightly different angle, which is also to agree that in the early years of the court, there was understandable caution um, at, um, at, at, at the judicial role, given that so many years of struggle to get a democracy, was this democracy then going to be hijacked and taken into the hands of the court, as well as the huge challenges of the legacy of apartheid. And also to also ask the question, which both of my colleagues have asked, whether 27 years later, close to 30 years later, this caution is still uh, warranted. And whether, given the rampant corruption, which we all know about and has been recorded, given the huge dysfunction in, in the state, the role of the court is now uh, much more to um, have a robust accountability to parts of the, the state in the way in which it delivers rights. But the part of the question that I would like to, uh, to, to talk about is whether there is space for defining the content of the right. And David briefly talked about um, the first paragraph, which talks about a right, and the second paragraph, which puts the duties on the state to take reasonable steps. Um, and the way in which the, the court has expressed or did express in the early judgments that Justice Majid referred to, it expressed its reticence to define the substance of the right was through a rejection of the minimum core. But I'd like to ask the question as to whether the content of the right can be defined without going back into questions about minimum core, because minimum core is, is closely related to the idea of progressive uh, realization. It's a temporal requirement. It's a what do we need to do now? What is the immediate requirement uh, on the state in order to fulfill the right? Which I think should be seen as a separate question, that is the sequencing, which steps should be taken first from what is the target? What is the content of this right? 
Um, so the first question is, is it legitimate for the court to um, give content to the right um, on its own, thinking about it separately from progressive realization and available resources? And the second question, does it remain legitimate for the court to define the substance of the right where a right is framed in terms of progressive realization and available resources? And to do that, I think there's a really helpful contrast between the right to education, which is also the first economic right, but is an immediate right and is not subject to progressive realization, and the rights which we've been talking about, access to housing, access or access to adequate housing, access to healthcare services, and access to nutrition, food, water, and social security. So if we start with the right to education, very quite early on in the jurisprudence of the court in the Juma Mushtid case, it was recognized that this is an immediate right. Um, and therefore, in a sense, the jurisprudence has gone in a different direction. Mostly in the high courts, rather than in the constitutional court itself. And in the early, in the cases in, you know, between 2010 and 2020, um, um, public interest litigants began to bring case, and I was also uh, uh, involved in those cases, on behalf of learners who were still being educated in schools made of mud in the Eastern Cape, quite a number of years, almost two decades after the end of the project. And those cases were brought in various forms to various high courts, and slowly the high courts began to develop what has now been called a bundle of entitlements. So in the Mazzotta case, the court, the, the high court held that the right to education includes the right of the conditions in which you are educated, which does include a desk and a chair. And that is the only way in which you can be educated compatible with, with dignity. So it gave a real substantive content and it said you have to deliver desks and chairs now. Um, the Mazzotta case also confronted the resources question, which was well known at the time, and everybody who's been in this field knows that the Eastern Cape was hugely dysfunctional. The um, people who were meant to be in the executive were either what they call in South Africa, eating the money. <laughs> the money was disappearing either through incompetence or through you know, blatant dishonesty. And the court said, you have to deliver a desk and a chair to every learner. And subsequently, there have been other ways in which the content of the right has been specified. Um, the right to textbooks, the right to scholar transport in certain circumstances, recently the right to school nutrition, and most recently the right to stationery as well as textbooks. Now, there doesn't seem to have been any quibble that the court could legitimately define the content of the right and that it didn't overstep its competence or its legitimacy to respond to applicants who said, we would like this aspect of the right. We don't have to have the global right. We don't have to say a right to education includes globally this ratio of students to teachers or this syllabus. But when someone, when a learner comes with a, 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 a complaint or does a, a demand about one aspect of the right, the court can then put together this bundle of entitlement. Even teachers pay, this was another aspect of the right. So I think we can perhaps bring this into the debate that the first paragraph doesn't need to be entirely um, vague, that there is a legitimacy in the competency of the court to give substance to a right. So the next question is, well, maybe the right to education is unique, um, because of its structure, the right to basic education has not been subject to progressive realization within available resources. So is there a sense in which we say, well, these are just two different trajectories of social socioeconomic rights, or the fact that the court can legitimately give substance to the right in the context of right to education could, in, in some sense, also be transposed onto that paragraph one, of the, of the other rights. Now, the, the other rights are, are slightly, um, I suppose, vaguer at one level, which is it's a right of access. So rather than the right to, 
Um, but on the other hand, there is a clear marker, which, as I said, is the right of adequate housing and the right of means of sufficient food and water. So there is within the constitution a mandate to say this is a constitutional standard which has already been set. Mm -hmm. And can we then say that the court could deal with this as you know, you, some of us have been saying from the very beginning, these are two separate questions. We first decide what we can say about the substance of the right. And then we ask the state whether it's entitled to drag its feet, largely speaking, and say, we don't have the resources now to do this, but we have a plan. We will do this progressively within available resources. Um, and I think just to, uh, as, as my last point, there are some interesting glimmers which Justice Majid referred to in both the Bloodley case and in Justice Majid's decision in uh, Tubakhali about how elements of the um, content of the right can nevertheless be specified and only secondly, progressive realization be determined. Um, in the Gladler case, this was a case in which um, it was a kind of sequence to um, the eviction of a whole lot of, of, of occupiers of derelict inner city housing. And they had been housed in temporary accommodation. And some of the rules of that temporary accommodation, which are kind of rules of a shelter, some people would know that a shelter needs to clean, have cleaning in the day. So they would require the residents to be out during the day. And then they would also be, require the residents to come back at a fixed time. And then the doors would be locked and there were separate accommodation for men and women. So this was clearly not a sustainable kind of accommodation if you had night work or you had a family and so on. And the question in, in there was, were these extra conditions which were attached to the shelter part of the right to housing or were there some a separate issue which could be should be decided separately? And although Justice Cameron in his, uh, in, in his decision went along a different route to the other judges, I think actually they both um, had a sense about that there was a, a right which had been breached. Um, from Justice Cameron's perspective, as Justice Majid uh, has already said, um, he said that the right to adequate housing, we need to pay attention to what adequate means. And adequate in this context means um, that the rules which are excluding it can make it inadequate. And we can see some analogies with the right to basic education includes the conditions of education. And that could be breached and had been breached in that case. And he also did, as, as you um, hinted, he said, we need to know what are the differential resources required. He actually looked at the sums that the, 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 the authority had done and said, well, it would actually, your, your solution is no, is really no more expensive. In fact, it could be more expensive because they had to provide some alternative. So that, um, this, I think, is a glimmer towards saying what does adequacy mean? Adequacy could include the rules. And interestingly, the other, ju the other judgments found a breach of the rights to privacy, um, security of the person, dignity, and so on. These are immediate rights, and these were immediately breached, and they needed an immediate remedy, which required resources. So even if you get there through another right, the court was still saying, that privacy matters, and we as a court, as part of our mandate, will say this is a, a breach which needs to be remedied, not sometime in the future, but now. And of course, in Tubakhali, um, in uh, the, you know, I agree, an unfortunate fact that your, uh, the judgment was in the minority, Justice Majid also said that the part of the conditions of adequate housing include what you call remedying spatial apartheid, so where the housing is. And this has been a huge issue. It doesn't really work to put your housing 20 kilometers out of the city when there's no work and no, no other. So all of these together, and this is the last point, show that there are ways in which adequacy can begin to be addressed. It could be that the court has to say, um, maybe not as a global thing, uh, adequate housing is too, you know, four walls and a bathroom and a bedroom and a, and a road, but that when applicants come to the court and say this is 
inadequate the court can begin to create content to write. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really some interesting thoughts there. Um, Taryn, I'm not sure if you've been able to hear everything, but we're going to turn over to you. Thanks very much, Kate. Can you see me and hear me? Um, we are bound to be able to see you, I think. Yes, great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I feel very much like an interloper in a very South African conversation, and it's great to see um, all of you here, and very nice to to e-meet you, just as Majid. Uh, and uh, David, huge con congratulations, of course, on your recent news. So um, as, as an outsider, I, I will not presume to to know enough to tell you anything about South Africa. Um, I have read the Tubakali case, uh, but I, I just wanted to make a few haphazard remarks based on my uh, understanding and impressions of the Indian experience, uh, which has a fairly long history of engagement with social rights. I understand that it's not directly um, transposable to South Africa for a variety of reasons, but at least, you know, at, at this juncture where South Africa is thinking about how to, where, where to go from here, um, not repeating India's mistakes uh, would, would at least be a good thing to do. So, um, so I think this question of social rights can be particularly, uh, complicated before courts because to, to my mind what what the court can do to secure social rights and what does it take to secure social rights in a given context are not necessarily the same question so any court has to approach the question with the full knowledge that uh, it is not the best placed institution uh, to to solve the enormity of the problem before it and what I want to put before you is the recent progressive turn in India against the Indian court's jurisprudence on social rights, or at least the growing articulation of the damage that the uh, that the Indian jurisprudence on social rights has done. And I'll mainly make three broad points. The first was that The Indian jurisprudence on social rights um, was thoroughly constitutionalized. The focus was in the judgments entirely on the injuries suffered by the claimants before the court. Now, this was a problem because like the Tubakali case, in almost all of the cases, and I'm, I'm not just talking about the handful of Indian, celebrated Indian cases that are read and taught uh, in law schools around the world, but um, the vast majority of cases often def decided by smaller benches that are, that are not so um, well known. In the vast majority of these cases, the question was not about state capacity, uh, state's financial capacity. In almost all of these cases, uh, there was a scheme in place. Uh, and the scheme, scheme's reasonableness or proportionality was not in doubt either. Like Tubakali, uh, my apologies if I'm pronouncing the case completely wrong, um, the question was one of maladministration, of rampant corruption uh, or just gross indifference uh, or incompetence in delivery. So the cases, almost all of these social rights cases that go to court as social rights cases were actually not really cases about social rights as such. There were cases about failures of governance and quite fundamental basic failures of governance. There have been some thinking in India about uh, what might have been had the court, instead of constitutionalizing these cases, thought about them as through the lens of administrative law rather than constitutional law. Um, and I have a paper with Professor Farah Ahmed in Melbourne on constitutional avoidance and social rights. Mother Kosla has a paper on conditional social rights. And the thought there is that unlike constitutional law, which focuses on the harm done to the victim, uh, an administrative law lens uh, 
could have led the court to develop a Southern jurisprudence on administrative law that takes the issue of state capacity seriously. So much of our administrative law is borrowed from the North, especially this, this country itself, that at least in the Indian context, and again, I know very little about Indian administrative law, even less about South African administrative law, but um, in some ways, constitutionalizing social rights in this uh, strong form way prevented the court from developing an indigenous jurisprudence on effective administration that could have given guidance to the administrators uh, in such cases of maladministration, of rampant corruption, et cetera. And it could have also perhaps developed tools of fixing accountability that would matter. At least the experience in India has been that uh, state bodies have absolutely no problem uh, in coughing up uh, compensation amounts and damages because it does not come from their own uh, pockets. Uh, it's it's a taxpayer who ultimately pays for damages, whereas uh, in administrative law, reimagination of what contempt powers might have looked like or what anti-corruption law might have looked like in a way that's readily enforceable could have perhaps, you know, in fact, as a response to this, one of the uh, key innovations in the Indian transparency law, the right to information law, was... Uh, that uh, non-enforcement uh, would cost um, the enforcing officer his salary on a daily basis rather than uh, the state having to pay up for it. And, and that law until recently, until Modi eviscerated it, uh, was very well uh, enforced. So that was the first point I want to make, that, that, that it shifted the attention away from what effective administration looks like and what courts can do to, uh, to encourage that. The second thing was that the Indian social rights cases saw a shift away from uh, and justified a move away from uh, judicial procedure and formality uh, in the name of substantive justice. And we all know these cases, cases on standing rules, on evidence, on remedies. Um, and this has come back, this, this dismantled uh, most of the rules of judicial discipline, which have come back to bite uh, progressives in a huge way, where we have a court that has a body of precedence that allows it to ignore any any of these uh, rules of judicial def, uh, judicial discipline, uh, but which is no longer ideologically committed to uh, to enforcing rights, let alone social rights. So, uh, so the court itself has become one of the key um, uh, institutions that breaches uh, human rights, uh, including to just give one example from recent years, uh, ordering. Uh, the government of Assam to conduct a citizenship register exercise, which rendered uh, potentially millions of people uh, stateless. So, and that was in order by the court, uh, a lawless court, in fact. Uh, Anuj Bhavania's recent book, Quoting the People, also points out how the, the social rights turn in India led to a court that seeks its legitimacy uh, in majoritarianism rather than in law-bound minority protection. Um, and that has had serious implications for, for the protection of civil and political rights in India. So, um, and finally, uh, at least I have not seen any concrete evidence so far in the literature that decades of India's Supreme Court's jurisprudence on social rights has actually done anything at all to, uh, to realize these rights in practice. In fact, um, the, the huge advance made in the noughties uh, in India in, in creating the rudiments of a welfare state in place uh, were all based on parliamentary action. Uh, now, of course, many of them have been unraveled. So the final point I'll perhaps make is this, that you know, um, maybe we are looking for answers in the wrong places. And apart from administrative law, uh, guarantor institutions of the sort that are found in chapter nine of, of the South African constitution, dedicated uh, guarantors for each of these social rights. Maybe that is where the answer is, right? Now, of course, we find courts attractive because you know, uh, you don't have to build a, a movement uh, and, and get politicians to act, uh, which is the harder work, right? But, but if, if we are interested in exploring effectiveness, uh, I think the Indian lesson definitely is to approach uh, courts as a panacea with 
with a with a fair measure of skepticism. Let's stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tara, for a perspective on these debates. Um, I think it will be a good moment now to turn over to the floor because we've got as many experts sitting out there as we have um, on the panel. So please feel free to put questions.